I divided the talk into three parts. <clears throat> First, some basic biomechanics of the hip and pelvis, such as the types of loading that the uh, hip undergoes and the stresses. Secondly, um, I want to show you a little bit about the mechanics of fracture and injury prevention, because I think we've learned a lot about uh, how these uh, injuries do occur, typically from uh, vehicle collisions and from falls. Um, and then uh, review a bit of, of fracture fixation biomechanics in the proximal femur and the pelvis. So the first thing to appreciate is that the forces in the hip are not static. And this is uh, data from Paul in 1976 that shows that the uh, compressive force in the hip joint uh, increases at heel strike, then decreases, and then uh, increases again at toe off, and also can be as much as um, between seven and eight times body weight in fast walking. So these are actually tremendous forces that couldn't be acting on the hip. Uh, the second thing to appreciate is that the force uh, uh, orientation is dynamic. <clears throat> it's not uh, stationary. It's not in one position. And especially if you think about uh, a view from the lateral side, uh, as you walk, of course, there is uh, a change in orientation of the compressive force. Similarly, on the femur, and since we've been talking, the other speakers have talked a lot about the femur, and femur mechanics also appreciate that the force angle changes uh, as uh, you go through uh, the normal gait uh, cycle. This is a fairly complicated diagram, and I'll try and give you a little explanation of it, but it has some simple uh, messages. Basically, this is a stress analysis that has been done on the femur, and there are two cases. Uh, first is without muscle forces, and the second is with muscle forces. Uh, the gray area uh, represents the stress. So if you were at the, uh, essentially at the surface of the uh, bone tissue, this would be the type of stress that the tissue would be um, undergoing locally. <laughs> and if you appreciate now that you can see some significant differences, first of all, where are the stresses located? Well, for the tensile stresses are on the lateral side compressive stresses on the medial side. Uh, comparing these two, this is with just the joint force, and this is with the effect of the abductors. So there's a tremendous um, uh, contribution of muscle forces to the overall force acting on the hip. <clears throat> um, the pelvis is a very interesting structure as well and really consists mechanically of three components, the two ilium and then the sacrum. Now, they're fairly tightly bound, but they do have motion. And these are some models that have been done um, by Schulten to just give you a kind of overview of where the motion occurs in the pelvis. Uh, the next diagram is, uh, shows in somewhat exaggerated form what happens in this case when there's a torque applied. And that torque can be applied, for example, in walking course, where your pelvis is actually undergoing some torsion. And what you see is some motion in the uh, sacroiliac joints and a lot in the symphysis pubis. So that kind of gives you a basic overview. I think uh, you can appreciate that the forces in the hip are high, uh, four to seven times body weight. The, ang the force is dynamic in that it's going up and down in terms of magnitude and also changing angle. Um, the second part of the overview is going to go into a little bit more about some of the uh, things you might not think about that much, but how these fractures really occur. Uh, and one major um, mechanism uh, is uh, car accidents, in particular for the pelvis and the hip, side impact collisions. Uh, we've done quite a variety of uh, studies on these types of collisions. And the major mechanism for loading the hip is the intrusion of the door. Uh, in that particular accident, this is a resulting fracture, and that's the only x-ray I'm going to be able to show, but at least to give you some insight into um, the resulting injury. <clears throat> this is what happens uh, during a collision um, simulation. This is actually a door uh, from a Toyota, and that poor fellow is just sitting there on a seat, 
and suddenly there is an impact from the side due to, for example, you're going through an intersection, someone runs a red light and smashes into the car. Uh, but what you can see in terms of loading is that there's really no way to escape that in this particular situation. It's simply that your body mass and the friction of the seat and all of these components uh, are just uh, not allowing uh, you to escape these forces. We've actually worked on a system that uh, helps to uh, move the occupant away from the, uh, the loading zone and not by moving the occupant but by moving the whole seat. So when the impact occurs, and it's going to come again. By the way, this is a slow motion film of uh, four meters per second, about 25 mile an hour collision. You actually move the whole seat along with the occupant away and into the center zone where you have the center console, and that reduces the forces acting on the uh, occupant. Uh, what we found is that from a point of view of injury uh, prevention, uh, the door intrusion is by far the greatest factor in terms of loading the hip and creating these uh, very significant pelvic and uh, hip injuries. This is a plot of the maxim maximum injury AIS. The AIS is the abbreviated injury score as uh, plotted with, uh, in door crush. So that's the amount of intrusion of the door uh, into the occupant space. And there's just a very direct correlation. So, <clears throat> Uh, the, the way to prevent these types of injuries, at least from a side impact point of view, is to move the occupant away, reduce the amount of door crush, and hopefully then reduce the uh, injury severity. So now let's look at some of uh, injury mechanisms uh, related to femur fractures. Uh, and this in particular case has to do with falls because falls, as you know, are a very um, significant mechanism in terms of causing these fractures. So the first thing to appreciate is in the normal femur, the uh, stresses are compressive inferiorly and tensile superiorly, but in a fall, the stresses are reversed. So you have essentially a bending uh, that wants to load the femur, and, and remember that it's going to fail first in tension, and I'm going to show you some um, high-speed video that was done by De Becker uh, simulating these injuries. So this is uh, basically just a set of still, still shots that you can't really appreciate all that much on, but it kind of gives you an orientation. So basically this femur is being impacted on the trochanter and the uh, head is stabilized and you're going to see that it's going to fail in the next uh, video. And there it goes. So that, uh, again, it's being loaded uh, on the trochanter, it's being supported on the femoral head, and it's a classic uh, failure that initiates on the tensile side. So at least we understand these things, um, and there certainly have been a number of attempts to try and reduce these forces uh, by using hip pads and other types of strategies. Okay, so the final part of the uh, discussion is just going to be uh, an overview of what we've learned about different types of fixation procedures. And you have to, of course, appreciate that these are done in a laboratory, that they are, you know, have, are not considering all the other patient, important patient considerations that you have to deal with. Um, typically, these uh, <clears throat> are models that are, uh, or specimens that are loaded, that are supported in the femurs, and they're loaded through the uh, spine, through L4, and they'll produce a compression and flexion uh, in the pelvis. So the first thing I wanted to do is just show you some results of screw sites because uh, you do have um, sometimes uh, the requirement to put screws in the pelvis in various places. And this is what we found in terms of pullout strength. This is pullout strength in kilograms. And then you can just look, you can locate the different sites uh, that have this highest pullout strengths <clears throat> and the inferior SI the lowest pullout strength. So it kind of gives you an appreciation, at least from a mechanical point of view, where the best sites uh, for screw purchase would be. There's quite a significant difference. And by the way, <clears throat> it shows you two different types, a cannula or um, cancellus <clears throat> and cortical screws. And there really wasn't any significant difference between the screw type. Uh, it was related to, the, related to the position of the screw and obviously the bone density.
So uh, another fixation problem, this one has to do with the ramus. <clears throat> and in this case, the model had to do with uh, fracture of the rami, uh, unilateral, and also uh, an SI disruption, sacroiliac joint disruption. And it shows you a number of different configurations. So there is a um, plate <clears throat> with four screws, plate with six screws, and then a short or a, a long um, uh, iliosacral screw. And this uh, shows you the amount of flexion um, that occurs at, in the sacroiliac joint. And again, it's one of the measures that we could use, but it kind of gives you a sense. Uh, what we found is that there were no significant differences. So between a plate or a screw, um, they would essentially accomplish the same thing. Uh, in all of these, you'll see some numerical differences. There's a fair amount of scatter in the data, but overall, no real significant differences. Uh, synthesis fixation. We looked at the number of different alternatives. Um, <clears throat> again, the t same type of instability model. And then looking at, for example, um, a plate with two screws, a uh, place superior, um, a plate and a, an SI screw, and then a dual plate configuration at 90 degrees to each other, uh, another dual plate configuration, but this one uh, is a superior and an inferior plate where the screws are being captured by both plates. Now, I don't know about the surgical technique of doing that, but this is a very interesting configuration mechanically. And then finally, a four-hole plate uh, without a screw. And <clears throat> you can see here that um, in this case, we've measured the gapping of the symphysis pubis. So we basically had an instrument uh, across there um, and shows <clears throat> that uh, this is a disrupted case where there's quite a bit of motion up to two millimeters. Now this, of course, is relative. The actual amount of motion really depends on the load that we apply in our, uh, in our test. But relatively speaking, the plate constructs are reducing the motion as much as possible, or as the most at least. Um, posterior pelvic fixation, uh, again, a number of different alternatives. <clears throat> and remember that these, again, are models that they're being loaded from the, um, from the uh, vertical, in the vertical direction through the um, L4 vertebrae typically, and they're being supported by the femurs. So uh, here we're looking at the SI joint gap, and <clears throat> we have a single screw, uh, two screws, two screws and a plate, two plates, and then we have a, a transverse plate with a screw, a transverse plate without a screw, a lot of different combinations here. And then we have some sacral bar configurations. Now again, I don't know how many of these you know, are actually in clinical use, but it is interesting to try these different configurations. Uh, in this case, the, just to give you an idea of what this data represents, Everything is being compared to configuration A. So this would have a number uh, value of one, and then everything that, all the other fixations that are uh, stiffer will have lower numerical values. And so you can see that the two screw configuration um, and really the two screws in the plate really gave you the uh, least uh, SI joint gap. So it kind of gives you a perspective, at least biomechanically, on what some different configurations can do for you. So I want to finish up with just some basic principles on uh, proximal femoral fixation. And uh, really, you've heard quite a bit this morning, but <clears throat> there really um, is a, a basic principle in relation to the biomechanics of fixation. And this is the orientation of these two vectors that make up the joint force. So if this is a static joint force, and remember I emphasize that really the force is moving around, it's not completely constant for sure, but uh, at any particular time you can break this up into two vectors. One that's going to be perpendicular to the sliding device and one that's going to be parallel. So <clears throat> the one that's parallel to the sliding device helps you and the one that's perpendicular doesn't help. <clears throat> 
uh, because it tends to uh, cause the whatever device is in here, screw, to rotate <clears throat> and start to bind and prevent sliding. Uh, some observations we've made in <clears throat> doing studies on cancella screws, uh, and we've looked at a variety of uh, factors, the bone density and the geometry of the femur, um, the length of the moment arm, the angle of the fracture, but really, in this case, the degree of inferior comminution and support <clears throat> was by far the most important factor uh, in preventing excessive displacement. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go for just a minute and see if they have questions. There's some things that we can control when we're dealing with femoral neck fractures, the quality of our reduction and what kind of implants, like Dr. Tatesman has been telling us. So a few things that we can't control, the fracture geometry and, of course, the bone quality. Uh, and what these three variables do that you see on this um, slide, uh, they're harbingers of instability. And probably nothing is more uh, problematic in terms of when we all see that fracture uh, that Powell's told us a long time ago is the increased verticality of the femoral neck fracture simply subjects it to increasing shear. Increasing shear results in fractures that don't want to heal because they tend to gap on the dorsal surface, they tend to slide, and they tend to be unstable. And we have very few implants currently that can negate or neutralize that amount of instability uh, from the positions that we place them, mainly on the lateral aspect of the proximal femur. And I think that when you start to see femoral neck fractures with inferior offset from their reductions and varus angulation from their reductions, these are the two biggest clinical predictors of failure. And I think this is the time when you need to start thinking about doing something. And like most non-unions, of fractures, there's a series of options, and I think refixation and bone grafting are com the common ones we would think about with most uh, non-unions, but I think valgization, osteotomy, and of course prosthetic replacement are the two that we should be uh, cognizant of when we're dealing with a proximal femur. And the um, successfulness of prosthetic replacement, I think, is, uh, is excellent, but I think there are certain patient populations that really um, need to have another go with their own normal anatomy and their own hip socket and their own hip joint. The valgization osteotomy really addresses the, the primary problem of the non-union, that is fracture instability commonly due to uncontrollable or uncontrolled shear forces. And why does it work? Well, Powell showed us, showed us the mechanical changes that occur and how they affect tissue, cartilage, and bone. And so it just tips the balance of fracture instability to stability, allows uh, in elimination of micromotion, vascular ingrowth to the non-union site, and of course, endochondral ossification, and Therefore, the fracture begins to heal. And all of this is simply done by just reorienting the fracture. Who gets it? Well, I think it's a, you go through the same thinking that you did that night that the patient comes in with a femoral neck fracture. Is this femoral neck fracture in this person, physiologic person, salvageable or not? And I think the same thought process usually, or for the most part, plays the same primary role. There are other conditions. You know, how much has the femoral neck uh, been uh, unstable? Is there any bone left in the femoral head? So there's a few other factors, but I think physi physiologically younger people with adequate bone stock to support fixation should at least have consideration for a valgus intertrochanteric osteotomy. According to Powell's, you know, pure compressive forces are at the femoral neck occur when the inclination of the fracture is about 25 degrees off the horizontal relative to the anatomic axis of the femur. Uh, and I think all of this can be dealt with by remembering these same biomechanical principles that Powell's has elucidated. But there's no question that when you're about to embark on one of these proximal femoral osteotomies, there are consequences and there are trade-offs. So in addition to getting the femoral neck to heal, I think that the proximal femoral osteotomy, especially the valgus osteotomy for this condition, allows you to correct a whole bunch of other situations. You can correct leg length inequalities. You can correct abductor tension. You can correct the amount of offset. You can correct a modest amount of external rotation deformity that may be present. And you can correct mechanical limb alignment. But without attention to detail and without planning these out, you can worsen any of these. Case one, a young man, he gets a femoral neck fracture. Uh, here are his presentation films. Uh, he has a clear neck non-union. He's beginning to drift with that inferior offset. He has gapping at the dorsal surface. His internal fixation, uh, which was adequate, is starting to show signs of bending, I think, uh, and certainly hasn't been up to the task to getting this to heal. Uh, 
And so like most things, you do your preoperative plan. We have comparison films. And the point of this particular case, I'm going to get right into some of the technical details of how to do some of these things, is the idea of supplemental neck fixation when you're putting in a chisel for your um, blade plate. Here we've pre-drilled across the sclerotic neck non-union site, which sometimes can displace as you're putting a chisel in without uh, drilling. Uh, we're going to obtain a 20 degree correction. We're going to use a 110 degree double angle blade plate. And the whole idea here that you may appreciate is, well, why in the heck did you shift over the shaft relative to the proximal femur? And this is a whole idea of shaft lateralization, the ability to take the shaft, pull it over to the side of the plate because it restores the mechanical limb alignment. You got to be careful when you do this because you still want to have enough surface area at your osteotomy site for this to heal. And so you'd like to typically maintain about two thirds of the osteotomy contact site. And the reason you do this offset is if you look at the x-ray on your left, you'll see what happens when you simply prop up the proximal femur on the shaft. You essentially get a what's uh, better termed as essentially an ice cream cone deformity. And if you look at the images on the uh, uh, schematic images on your right, you'll see the effect that, of what happens when you deal with these particular problems. And if you're not aware of uh, just propping this up, you'll end up overloading the lateral compartment as the mechanical axis now flows far too far to the uh, lateral side of the knee and gives you a lateral compartment to overload. These are subtle things that occur to the entire limb when you go ahead and deal with uh, proximal femoral osteotomies. I don't know how close something needs to get to 25 degrees to heal. I don't have that answer, but I can tell you it doesn't have to be at 25 degrees to heal for per compressive forces. Uh, simply the idea of getting this uh, better than the vertical angle it maybe uh, was dealt with at the time of the accident or the reduction uh, seems to be enough. It's always a trade-off, like I said earlier. Whenever you decide on how much of a wedge to take out, your goal is to get as much compressive forces as possible, but you have to recognize that the more and more you prop someone up into valgus, there are trade-offs, and there's trade-offs with the abductor mechanism, there's trade-offs with the amount of bone contact, uh, healing, stabilization, how you're gonna get your blade in, and all these types of things. And so really shooting for the normal other side is what I'd like people to understand what they need to do. The usefulness of this uh, procedure is probably one of the most reproducible ones uh, for this particular problem of any kind of procedure we do. Uh, and here you can see in six weeks, we already have changes, not just at the osteotomy site, but already at the femoral neck site, just by changing the orientation of the forces. And at six months, everything has healed, and he ultimately gets his uh, plate out for local uh, symptom relief and a healed femoral neck fracture. Restored offset, mechanical axis that's appropriate and very similar to his contralateral side. Case two, I think, has some interesting points about what do you do with a vertical femoral neck fracture that begins to lose its reduction, yet doesn't have a ton of deformity. It has some, but it doesn't have a lot of deformity. Here's a fracture that was expertly openly reduced and clamped. It has uh, screw fixations that are really trying to hold uh, as much uh, fixation to avoid the shearing forces in this uh, area, but at six weeks, the patient is already starting to lose his reduction. And I think that waiting on something like this, while you can wait, it's probably already telling us that this is giving it up. This is unlikely to go ahead towards union. So the timing of when you do this is based on when you think this doesn't have a good chance or an adequate chance to go on towards union. So here we have a bit of a valgus shaped reduction already not a lot of deformity, it's early. We have neck instability because it's early. And so we're just gonna take out a 15 degree wedge. I understand that this is not gonna get us really that much closer to, uh, to uh, 25 degrees uh, for pure compressive forces, but I would really like this to not be a very deformed proximal femur. And so here we've simply uh, drawn out our, our wedge. We're bisecting the 30 degree wedge that you can see at the bottom angle here. And we're gonna create this wedge just five degrees off of the horizontal and we're gonna put in our blade plate five degrees off the horizontal because the two uh, match, the two angles match. Uh, and so we take our saw, we go ahead and do our osteotomy using our guide pins as, uh, for me, guide wires. Essentially, I can use them as a monorail to drive the saw across uh, and give us a good uh, removal um, and uh, remove uh, the wedge. And we go ahead and take down his uh, osteotomy and close him up. 
much less offset here because he didn't have a lot of deformity. Supplemental fixation up into the head because this is an acute fracture still. This is kind of a relatively unstable one. You have to be careful placing a chisel across an unstable neck because as soon as you encounter the head fragment, it will tend to displace and spin around. And so all those preoperative drawings you did start to become a little bit irrelevant because it's all changed. So you have to be careful with some of that. Here we have less lateralization because we have less pre-existing deformity. We have a less aggressive uh, correction, but I think we have a mechanically very stable situation. And just in a very short period of time, his osteotomy and his femoral neck goes on to heal. Once again, not with a pure correction to what Powell's would say are pure compressive forces, but adequate enough without very much deformity of the proximal femur compared to his contralateral side. And should problems occur, and they will with these particular femoral neck fractures, this patient doesn't have a crazy proximal femoral anatomy that will impair a hip replacement surgery should he need it in the future. So in conclusion, I think it's really important for us to consider intertrochanteric osteotomy for the physically, uh, physiologically young person uh, for trauma. I think it uh, reproducibly and consistently can give us good results in the literature with the biggest <laughs> series of these uh, from Dr. Marti and others just shows uh, really terrific results that are long standing. I think the foundation of it that's so much fun is it's all mechanical principles and based on, on anatomy and mechanics. This is the last slide I want to leave you with. Uh, this all has to occur before you even set foot in the operating room. Uh, and all these things have to be drawn out. And I know that we don't print out many x-rays now, if ever, but I just sit there with my tracing paper. I put it on the PAX machine. I draw it on the screen, and then I take that sheet of paper off, and I just carry on like that. Uh, and so it still all can be, uh, can be done before. Thank you.